and a fly has just appeared in my room. So if you see me doing this, I'm not hitting you, Kira, or hitting myself. <laughs> it's it's a damn fly that's gone around the place. I got rid of him before we went live. Come on in, everybody. Say hello. We're, we're, we're honored tonight to be joined by the wonderful Kira Derryberry. And we were just talking about, yeah, so so Kevin's name, your husband, is his surname is Derryberry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and it's an originally an Irish name, you were saying. Yeah, that's what they think. That's okay. what we think. Yes. Okay. Based on our based on our 23andMe results and all that. So all right. So mm-hmm. so when they moved to so it was probably something like um there's there's a really famous company that make really high quality shoes here called Dubarry. Dubarry. Oh yeah. It probably was some variation of it, or it could have been that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yes it would have been that because I, I hadn't heard it here in ireland so um so now we've got we've got the link there with the surname yes yes <laughs> so we so whenever that his his uh family came over from europe um it just it's one of those names that got totally changed when they came in yeah and that's that's happened a lot you know over the years because um my name royal isn't very common or yle but um mm-hmm. we, we have our own language in ireland uh you know so mm-hmm. I'm with you, means are you well in in irish um and um apparently the irish version of our name is very like the irish version of o'reilly but apparently oh, okay yeah so apparently the o'reilly's were in cavan there was a major falling out in the family when we spoke irish at that time yeah uh-huh. um, many many moons ago i don't know many hundreds of years ago but they fell out anyway and the crowd at lost moved to kerry which was our family so when the when it was anglicized the name then they became O'Reilly and we became Riles. So there you go. Yeah. There you so go. So something similar, right? Just different, yeah. Yeah. different yeah. context. Some yeah. circumstance caused caused it to uh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yes, 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 yes. So um for those who don't know Kira, I'm sure everyone knows you, Kira, at this stage, but Kira is a board member of PPA and um, she's an amazing photographer, she's an amazing business person. And she's really, really good with tech as well. And Kira, I want to talk about the other things more than the tech piece because you're already known for the tech piece. But I do think, because this think tank's all about the business of photography, right? Um, mm-hmm. And I haven't come across somebody in our industry who's so good with the tech piece. Even Mary Fitz Taylor just raves about Kira with the tech <laughs> and how you're able to how you're able to, you know, find an app and plug it in and now they can order their headshots online and their times and all that sort of stuff. So we're not going to go into the how to do it, but we, we'll talk a little bit a little bit later about, um, you know, what sort of things you can do and how you might go about thinking about it um, and stuff like that. But I want to talk more about how you got into photography first. So tell us your story as to how you fell in love with this crazy, wonderful, amazing industry of ours. I will, I will. So um, I actually am one of those rare people that wanted to be a photographer when I grew up. So when I was in high school, I had, uh, I was very lucky to have a great art department in my high school. We had a dark room and that's where the bug bit me there, you know? So I shot film with my friends and it was just like, the only thing I cared about. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Rewind, rewind. You're not old enough to have shot film. Yes. Not professionally. No but yes. that. You're kidding me. <laughs> oh, I'm older than I look. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, so me and my, in high school, you know, black and white photography, uh, developing our own stuff, uh, spending a lot of time in the dark room. I ended up going to University of Alabama, and uh, that's where I met my husband, Kevin, and spent a lot of time in the dark room there. I was actually the key, one of the key holders for the dark room there. So I would be there late at night, like mixing the chemicals for people and working on my own projects. And Kevin, who was dating me, um, would sit in the lobby of the art building and read. That's <laughs> a joke us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> room, you weren't processing photographs, go away with that. You're, you're <laughs> but you, lose, you lose track of time. Like, you know, time means nothing in the dark room. Like you're in there forever and it's dark and you just, it's just like, it's like a being in a casino, you know, like you don't, you don't know how long you've been in there. So Kevin would, um, would wait for me and I would work late at night um, as a key holder there. Uh, but then when I got out of college, the, as much as I wanted to be this when I grew up and, and studied for it, um, 
nobody actually taught you how to be a business owner in college uh, in, the, in art. So you go, you're like, I want to be a photographer. So I'm going to major in art. You don't think I'm going to major in business. You think I'm going to major in art, you know, and then you have wonderful teachers who teach you all about art and teach you all about your craft and, and, you know, and then you get out and you're like, oh crap, I don't actually know how to, how, well, where do I go to start a photography business? What do I charge? Where do I do? So I just sort of uh, panicked and didn't do that. Like I graduated and I was, and then I got the, I got a job doing something that I was also doing uh, during college, which was web design. So that's the tech, that's my tech background. My dad um, taught me HTML programming when I was 14 or 15, the very early incarnations of web design. So I was in high school building websites um, and uh, programming. And then uh, I worked at University of Alabama for their uh, web department, being a web designer there. So when I graduated, I was like, well, I guess I'll just be a web designer. So I got a job at an advertising agency um, building websites for, for different, all different types of companies with all different types of needs. Um, I ended up getting into some sales for websites for that. So I would meet with the client, find out what it is they needed to have their website do. And then I would had a team that I would go work with to do that. So, uh, I didn't get into the business of photography until we had that housing market crash here in the U S and, um, by then I had a baby. Lucy. And I had not really been doing anything with my photography because I had been pretty busy at this job for five years. And, um, but then the housing market crashed. Our uh, economy was tanking. The company wasn't doing well that I was working for. And a lot of us got moved to part-time and I had been taking some pictures of my friends, kids, cause you know, and my baby and, and all that. And then I thought, well, I just got cut to part-time. What, what other skills do I have? this, I guess I'll try and do this, <laughs> which is what I wanted to do in the first place. So I, I, I joke about this all the time because during that crash is when some photographers say the, the digital camera boom happened when a lot of moms with cameras showed up and started opening businesses and, um, and they use it in that term in a, in, a, in a not so nice term. I'm one of those moms with cameras <laughs> and um, out of necessity went back to, to what I knew. And um, so, so my business was born then. And I did a lot of things super raw <laughs> in the beginning, but, but I made it here and now 10 years in. Yeah. So. So, so, so there's a couple of things that I'd love to talk to you about and deep dive into on that. I'll start okay. backwards, right? I'll start on the last thing you said which was about um, the last recession we had. And we're having a yeah. post-COVID recession now, you know, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of people losing their jobs as well and stuff and companies cutting back. And do you think there's going to be an influx of more photographers into our industry now for the same reason? Or do you see it being different this time? I think it might be a little different this time. I mean, it's possible that it, that there could be, but there was a, there was a point where digital, when the transition from film, film seemed so complicated to people, and then when it became digital, it was so easy. You know, it just became so like you know, you know instant gratification. But I, I think that generationally, we're talking about a whole different generation of people now, and I don't think that they are as excited by that prospect as people were, you know, people were getting gifts, digital cameras for Christmas. And the next thing you knew, they had a business. I don't think we're going to see the exact same thing. And we're going to see something similar or something that kind of reminds you of that. But I don't think it's going to be like that explosion of new photography businesses. You know, if anything, I think the last decade has taught us that it, being a photographer is not as easy as people thought, you know, <laughs> like getting into the business is not as easy and being sustainable for the long term is not as easy as people thought. So um, I don't know. I mean, you know, time will tell, but my gut is telling me we're not going to see it, at least in that same way that we saw it before. And I know when I've talked to other photographers who are around, I still can't get over that you're around the film era, era but anyway, um, the, the, I've talked to other photographers, you know, say second, third generation photographers, you know, and they, they've said to me, you know, my dad or grandfather as a photographer, you know, they were scientists. Um, yes. While today, you know, a photographer has to be more of an artist and a customer service person and a marketeer that so government has changed. Or would you agree with that? Or 
Absolutely. Absolutely. It, you have to wear so many hats in this business because it takes so much to get successful at it. You know, it takes so much to get off the ground that you kind of have to, to wear all those hats and then, or even just to get to a point where you can hire somebody to wear some of the other hats, you know what I mean? So it's hardest in the beginning for everyone. And the, it's true that the, the, when people were using film and those generational photographers that you're talking about, that's all they had to focus on was the science of it, the math, the chemistry, you know, I mean, they even had retouchers that that was their job to do the retouching, you know, and then they had a salesperson that was their job to do the sales, you know, um, it's a very different world that we're in now. So, so I think the ones that are thriving are the photographers that are adapting and able to take on other roles in their business and multitask um, as best they can. Right. That, that's really interesting. And, and, you know, when we, you talk there about, it's the same here in Ireland. Like I have a look at some of the, the, the university for the photographers go to and the courses that they do. And there's not an iota of business in it. Like it's, it's all yeah. about the art and the lighting and whatever else they do. And I've never Which been to art important. school. That's important, you know, it, but it just doesn't make sense to me. And maybe it's because I've all been business and it just, I go, really, you know, well, I, you know, coming from somebody who went through that, you know, it didn't even dawn on me during that time. I was so motivated to do something interesting and to show art. And it was almost, it was almost um, frowned on to make a lot of money on something because like, you know, I don't know, there was that whole starving artist. I mean, I, rem I literally, I remember saying out loud, like, I'm never going to go digital. Like, I just, I love you know, squeegeeing prints and really getting my hands in here and doing this. I remember being that person that was just really there for the art of it. And I'm still there for the art of it, but I'm practical now because I can't be there for the art of it and not, and not be there for the business of it, you know? So, I mean, you know, that's why when I got involved with PPA, not to do a PPA plug here, but PPA has so many business resources that were helpful to me because I didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> you know? And so I'm always steering people in that direction or to find a wonderful business coach like yourself or Mary, you know, to kind of get you started in that direction. Because my goodness, if you don't, it's, it's one thing to know how to be a, an amazing photographer, but it's another thing to know how to charge for it or make any money at it or, or plan for long-term financial things, you know. And, and we, we talked a lot about this when we were, when we had that great time in Italy, in Italy with XXB. Yeah. Do you remember the Pirates Bar? Do you remember that? Oh gosh, do I remember the Pirates Bar? <laughs> yes, yes, I remember the Pirates Bar. Yeah, we we had those are the nights, man. <laughs> <laughs> we missed those nights, though. They were crazy. I know. They were crazy. I miss, guy, I miss guys, those we, nights. We found this Pirates Bar. There was how many was it? Was about eight of us, was there? Yeah. It was, it was mm -hmm. the usual suspects. There was Kevin Jordan. Mm -hmm. There was yourself and Kevin. There was okay. uh, Mary and Jamie, myself. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember if there was someone else there. But anyway, we found this Pirates Bar in Italy that was supposed to be closed or probably shouldn't have been a bar at all. But we walked into the Pirates Bar anyway, and it's all in it's a tiny room and um, all in Pirates memorabilia. So I went up to buy a drink for everybody and the barman, we got talking and he, he was Italian, but really good English. And he recognized I was from Ireland, my accent. And he said, uh, what are you looking for? So I'm just trying to get a drink for the guys. What, what do you have that's Irish? And he says, come here with me. And he tried to bring me in the back. And Kevin, <laughs> was it your Kevin or Kevin Jordan that was beside me? One of the two Kevins was beside One me. of the two Kevins. And um, I said, I'm not going in there. He said, no, you have to go. So said, well, you come with me. <laughs> so we go in anyway. <laughs> and he brings us down and he opens this press. And there's bottles and bottles of Irish whiskey. And there was this bottle anyway. I don't know if you remember it, but it was... I think it was about 30 years old, but it wasn't whiskey, it was Pucheen. So for those yeah. who are from Ireland, Pucheen is Irish moonshine. It's alcohol made from potatoes. Yep. And it's illegal mostly. But this bottle was so old, they must have made it at that time. In fact, I think in the last couple of years, they've started to make it again and sell it into places. But um, anyway, he brought that bottle out and we opened that bottle. Well, I tell you, it was like petrol, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it was like drinking gasoline it was, it was uh, like drinking gasoline it, it was, was uh, you, could, you could run your car on it or your, or your truck but anyway that was some 
that was some intense Irish drinking. That was, that was, that was, that was, that was. So, um, yeah, so we won't say any more about it because um, what, 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 what happens in Italy should stay in Italy and the Pirates Bars. I shouldn't even have said that much. Oh, the Pirates Bar, though. Gosh, what a great memory. You know, God, you know, I just, I have so few, there are so few, a handful of times in my life where, where I get together with photographers and we have amazing nights. You know, I mean, I, I can think of a lot of times, but those times, those like shenanigans nights, man, I am craving 2020 has deprived me of shenanigans and I need it. So hopefully, hopefully we will get to get together again soon. And what, and what was funny about it, Kiris, it's like those shenanigans nice that you say, like it was unplanned. We were all going mm-hmm. home after having dinner and somebody said, let's go. I think it was Kevin Jordan. He's always leaving. It's always Kevin, it's yeah. always Kevin mm-hmm. Jordan. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. t- he had to tie us up and drag us, didn't he? Like we weren't, we weren't going to go. Oh out. yeah. Yeah. We were just real hating <laughs> on going out. <laughs> oh I do, man I do remember the next day and we were going on a tour do you remember we were we were going on boats and everything and anyway you guys were a lot better than me but I was worse for wear I was, I was oh, you didn't say a word for about no 12 hours of the day yeah. <laughs> it was about that it was about that it was about that just yeah. quietly smiling I'd look over and you just smile I'm like oh he doesn't feel good <laughs> Yeah, I remember looking at one stage and because it was April, but it was still quite warm. And mm-hmm. I, I had a jacket and a jumper and all on me and the sweat was rolling off me. And I was oh, so it's hot. hot. And it was only because I was, you know, I shouldn't have been wearing a, <laughs> a jumper and a jacket. We were all not dressed appropriately. Like we thought it was going to be colder than it was. But then we had like hiked up this hit, this mountainside or whatever right. to get to this awesome restaurant that we That's were all right. excited about. And then we waited forever. That's right. So, <laughs> we were about an hour in the line or the queue. Yeah, to get in. Yeah. But anyway, back to the, we better stop talking about that because we've got viewers and all. <laughs> Sorry, guys, we went on a bit of a tangent there. Um, but anyway, let's get back to the um, business of photography and stuff and the education piece. So we talked about PPA and, and, and PPA do an amazing job. And Angela, head of, head of the education, does an amazing job. And you as the board, as a member of the board, you know, you're so f- much behind the business of photography. And like when we had the first lockdown and the first quarantine, like you guys just opened up your resources to every photographer, whether you were a member or not, which was an amazing thing to do. But do you think if we get back to the psychology of people studying art and the fact you mentioned that like business is nearly frowned upon, you know, Mm -hmm. we're artists, we're not business people. Do you think that'll ever change or is there an advantage to a change in, or should it just be left as it is and the business gets tagged on later? Or what, what's your gut on that? Uh, you know, I think there's always going to be that sort of like, you know, starving artists, you know, I suffer for my art sort of jam. That's going to, that's always going to exist. But I do think, especially because technology has changed so much just, you know, since I was in college and, and before, I do think that people are going to start paying, you know, paying more attention. I need to be able to pay bills. You know what I mean? You can't make art if you can't buy food for yourself and your family, you know? So people, I think you also have to decide as a business owner and as an artist, what type of art you're going to create. Like myself, I started out as a pretty hardcore artist. Like I'm going to, you know, I want to be a photographer and I want to capture all these things. And I still do that for fun. I try and do my artwork for fun and for me, but I also try and use my skills to run a business. So it's, it's a separate thing for me. You know, I create artwork for me that I enjoy, but I don't necessarily offer those services that I do for me that I enjoy that take time and energy and that sort of thing to directly to my clients. I have products, a product line of services that I offer that I do for my clients that are a commodity. And then I have a product line of services that I offer for um, my clients who commission me to create artwork of their families, you know, but none of that I would consider to be the type of like hardcore artist stuff that I personally enjoy and what got me into photography, you know? So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think if somebody, somebody really, there has to be a switch that happens where you can go, I can still be an artist and I can still do this skill that I have to make money you know what I mean because photography is a commodity that everybody needs you know whether it's just you need a headshot for your LinkedIn you know profile or your zoom or you need you need portraits of your family to make sure that you record a document this time everybody in this day and age has a need whether or not they can afford it at different levels is another thing but they have a need 
for photography. So if photographers specifically can delineate that line, you know, can, can separate themselves and go, I can still be an artist and I can still make money. And that doesn't mean that I've sold out, you know? <laughs> no, and I think that's a great point because it, it's something that I str struggle with all the time because I can't even take a selfie, right? Like I, 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 mm -hmm. I, I'm not a photographer, never have been, would love to. And then I just get so busy with other stuff like it's not my passion you know to, to be a photographer but i love the business of photography and i love the industry and what photographers do but what, but what i'm always wondering about is and you, you mentioned it there a little bit about the you know you have to set aside time to fulfill that creative need you have as an artist mm -hmm. but you also recognize that what you create as an artist won't necessarily what people will buy right in your skill set mm -hmm. that they're two different mm -hmm. things and, and, and you've managed to i think you used the word switch you know a switch from one to the other so when you yep. create art it's for you and then but i tell you what's always and hopefully you can help me with this because i actually haven't discussed this or anyone i don't think or we may have but we will be too drunk that we need to remember <laughs> <laughs> and those who are with us remember well I, I tell you what i struggle with a lot this is why i struggle because you're a judge as well right mm -hmm. Can you tell me why is there not a commercial element to judging in photography in terms of did the image sell and what did it sell for? Mm. You mean, well, I can only speak in regards to, to PPA style judging, but I really feel that um, when we go into PPA style judging, so for those who aren't familiar, we have the IPC, which is the Intergra uh, International Photographic Competition. And we have 12 elements that we judge on. And what you're talking about, sellability, saleability is not one of the elements, okay. right? Um, because that competition is about the art and the craft. Okay. And not about the sale. This is about, this is about your craftsmanship. This is about you understanding lighting, understanding um, technique and style and composition and understanding all those things, not for the client, but for the craft of photography. And so there's plenty of times where I see an image in image competition and I go, well, that is a sellable image all day long. That is an image that that family, that family portrait of 12 people, you know, lined up and posed. That is a sellable client image. Here's why it doesn't do well in the competition world, because while it satisfies the need for the client and the client would certainly be very happy, it breaks a lot of rules that aren't don't, that don't feel broken for the intent of the sale nor for the intent of the art. So clothing consultations, nobody's clothes matches, you know, in it, or it looks like they just showed up after dinner. They went to dinner at, at a nice restaurant and they all showed up and what they were wearing, you know, the lighting isn't right, but you can see everybody's faces, those sort of things fine for client client is okay. Clients happy to have everyone looking at the camera, smiling, looking, you know, halfway decent and, commemorating the time with their family but the other things that make the image a good quality image for the art of it and for the craft of it and for and and being an expert in posing groups like drake um be safe right an expert in posing large groups well that's missed and that need isn't something that the client necessarily has every time if they go to drake they do you know what i mean because they're hiring him they're commissioning him to do what drake does you know does that yeah, make sense I yeah, it does. And, and here's where, where my struggle is, right? And mm -hmm. I, I really struggle with this, right? So I'm hoping you might help me with it. I understand that. I understand the need for the art. But like when I look at all the award ceremonies and all the awards, it's always about the art. Mm -hmm. And, you know, humans, we need recognition, right? It's just the way we're built. You know, we crave recognition, whether we're aware of that or not, but we do. We crave recognition. And if all the awards are for the art, does it mean that we encourage photographers to concentrate too much on the art and therefore mm -hmm. they don't have time to concentrate on the business side? Well, I can see how you can feel that way, but let me put it to you this way. Mm. When photo photographers know too much about photography, they do. So the people that they raise up are the people that really show them impact visually you know this is ben shark for example creates some visually stunning um manipulated comp composite pieces you know with 
you know, beautiful artwork and illustrative. I mean, it looks like it came out of a movie. That's the kind of work that blows a photographer away, right? Now, Ben could take an amazing picture of a high school senior that he does for his everyday work. He doesn't every single time turn out like an amazing epic piece, although most of his stuff is, but he'll do a commodity-based shoot with high school seniors, just with good lighting, nice posing, good outfit choices, good location, you know, everything matches, but it doesn't have that wow factor. The wow factor is what photographers see. The wow factor isn't necessarily what your client sees because we clients and photographers have a different um, mindset for what is the wow factor, right? Those commodity pieces that Ben creates as senior photos for his clients, that's the wow factor for the client. That is good at that. Their little daughter looks amazing. They can't believe how phenomenal she looks. She looks like a superhero. He's done, he's done an amazing job, but it, it misses on the epic wow factor that his competition work does because he has to go that much further to impress photographers. You know, yeah. and photographers, it's judged by photographers, it's entered by photographers, you know, it's won by photographers. Uh, and I get that. And and Ben is an amazing artist and also an amazing business person. So he has both together, right? Mm, he has both. Really good business. Mm -hmm. But I see a lot of great photographers. Like I've been at award ceremonies where I know the photographers who are winning the awards, right? And let's say 10, 10 photographers walk in just to keep the math easy for me. You know, I know that five of those are struggling to put dinner on the table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and yet they spend so much of their time honing their art to get that recognition and those awards. Because they did make and the slip. At the expense of their spending some time in the business of photography. And that's where I struggle a little bit. And I feel no matter where I go in the world, and I understand the reason why, and I understand why it's important, but I wonder, do we need to find a way to recognize excellence in the business of photography that's focused on the business? I don't know how we do that. Because um, yeah. like, I've tried like with organizations, say in the UK, which we, we launched last year, the Business of Photography Awards and MPA, and the Guild are doing something similar now. And there's some moves that direction. But still, mm -hmm. like when you look at, and I know it's early days with it, but when you look at the entries, you know, um, the volume of entries is so trying to encourage photographers even to enter is is, is difficult. <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, yeah, I know. Because they see the work and they're like, well, shoot, I couldn't. How am I to compete with that? But the nice thing about about IPC is, and 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 this may also be hard to to grasp, but but follow me here. It's, it's called a competition, but you're not actually in, I'm not in comp, when I enter into Photographic Open, I don't consider myself in competition with Ben. You know what I mean? I'm never gonna be, I'm never going to be able to do what Ben does, you know, and that's okay. And that's okay. I still enter this competition because I'm competing with my results from last year. I'm always competing with myself. I enter that competition to better my work and myself and to get the feedback and to get the, you know, so, and to try something different every year for me personally. But the nice thing about watching that competition, at least for me, is when I'm watching it and I'm watching it with, if I'm not judging and I'm watching it with my friends, we're all cheering for each other. It's all about, it's all about, it's not about like, did I do better than my friend? Did I do better than Ben? Did I do what, you know, I'm not, <laughs> it, it creates it for me anyway, it creates a sense of community where we're all rooting on each other to do better, to score well, and less about like, I couldn't possibly enter this competition because I can't do Richard Sturdivant or Ben or Dan McClanahan or any of those amazing artists. Because those guys are kick butt artists. I don't think that, per and I can only speak on behalf of myself, but I don't think that personally, I, I want to I learn all that stuff, but I don't think that I'll ever pursue it that hard because I won't ever be able to find a balance for pursuing my business skills. I have to find a middle ground so that I can continue to create, create and get better and improve with my photography, but also continue to excel as a business owner and to, keep, and to um, uh, put food on my table and to keep the lights on, you know what I mean? So I don't think that, I, you know, you talk about the photographers that you see doing so well in image competition, but you know that they don't have a thriving business. They're extremes, you know what I mean? Like they're all in on just honing and honing and honing and getting these amazing work and they are artists, you know, and that's that they are artists. I, as a business owner, don't know that I would consider myself 
an artist when it comes to my business. I know that I like, I have art that I like to create and I may never have the time that I want to pursue it in the way that the other photographers have, but that's the balance because you're but one person, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're, you're but one person. So I, I hear what you're saying about, do, are we, are we shining such a high light on, on, on photographers who create something almost unattainable and it doesn't equal sales? You know what I mean? It doesn't always equal sales. In Ben's case, yes. it does, right? Yes. That's the bit I struggle with. <laughs> I know, I know, because you're because but but it's because you're a numbers guy, yeah. and you're not a you're you don't have the artist heart. You have the business heart, <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering, I mean, is there a way to? Uh, it, it's it's not even the business heart, Kira. It's as much because all the recognition comes for the art, mm-hmm. and not running with, a successful art business, right? <laughs> that is there is there are those things just not possible to align or is there do you think there's a way to align them or is that something we should even consider as an industry well i think it'll be hard to measure you know what i mean because the thing you can quantify the art you can see the impact of the art we can hear about the the business and how well the business is doing but how do you actually physically show it how do you show that i'm an amazing business owner other than just that you have clients coming in and out of the door and you're obviously, you know, you know, making sales. I, that would be my question for you. How would one, if, if, tell me how you would put together highlighting amazing business owners. Where's the proof? Where's the physical tangible item that I can show and be like, look, this means I'm good, you know? Cause that you can do that with, with the art side of it. And maybe that's why it's so much, it's a little bit easier to highlight. You know, mm. I think that you're onto something. I think that, yes, we need to be, recognizing amazing business owners and and striving to be them and putting them up in the way that we've put up artists you know so that people can not only you know you look up to people that that win in these competitions you go gosh i hope one day i can do i can be as good as that you know i agree with you we need to have other business photography business owners on pedestals so that we can look to them and they and that exists you know they're teachers they're our educators they're the ones that are out there teaching on the business stuff you know that isn't as fun for me personally as the Photoshop class, but it is what I need to be successful. And I know that, you know, yeah. well, so, I, well, I suppose the ultimate test is show, show us your accounts for the year, but very few are going yeah. to do that. Right? <laughs> How are you <laughs> going to get people to do that? <laughs> so, so but I suppose you can break business down into different elements. So you could have a, um, a website competition. Yeah, enter for the best mm-hmm. photography website in newborn and headshots and, you know, across yep. the different genres. You could um, submit your client experience journey, you know, mm-hmm. map it out, submit that. You can have, um, you know, so you can break down the elements, I think, you know, sub- submit your sub um, sub pieces. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. uh, subcategories like, um, like, like uh, you're building a competition. <laughs> <laughs> yes it, it is a competition and it's it's yeah. it's it's and maybe see i'm not familiar with ipc and how it works right mm-hmm. because I, I i'm new to the us as you know so yep. i'm not fully familiar with it while i in the uk and ireland i've been at you know for 20 years i've been going to events and it's all about the um i'm not saying there's anything wrong with it i'm just saying on its own it like I a question, different animal i question yeah. mm-hmm. it is a competition you know you so see you have mm-hmm. your you've your bronze and silver and golds awarded monthly, say at a monthly level on print competition. Um, and then you have your annual awards and you people get merits and then you get the finalists and then there's an overall winner. Yeah. But do you think, okay, I'm going to pose this question to you. And, it, and I think, I think it's because we are both coming at it from you are so business-minded and I am, I like the technical stuff. I like the, you know, the science and the camera stuff and the art. So I would venture to guess, and I can speak about photographers, that photographers, most of the ones I know who get into it, they don't get in it, into it because they want to be successful photography business owners that make tons of money that are able to do this and that and the other. They get into it because they love photography. So when they get into it because they love photography, the business side is just not as exciting or interesting as, oh my gosh, I love photography. And here are five photographers that I think are amazing and I wanna do something like them, you know? And then you go and study with them and you go, 
that's what excites a lot of new business owners. It's just not an, it's like if I, if I wanted to be an architect, I would go to college to study to be an architect, right? And I would learn the tools of the trade so that I could then go work and make money to be an architect, right? And so it would excite me to learn the tools of the trade to go and do, to do that. And then I would just get a job and I would make money doing it. It just seems so, so much straightforward, more straightforward than the business of photography. Because the problem is, is you're dealing with artists who are excited visually by art and not by numbers. It's very rare, I think, that somebody is like, you know what? I have a grand money-making scheme. I'm going to become a photographer, <laughs> you know? And so I think that's just, the, that's the disconnect that I think we're seeing here. Photographers are just not as excited about business as they should be. Because at the end of the day, it's much less about how good a photographer you are and much more important how good a business owner you are to find success, you know? But, but you, we talked a little bit earlier and I understand exactly where you're coming from, right? And mm -hmm. I don't think we're, we're going to align tonight in, in an hour. You know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but, but one, of my, one of my questions is about that is, you know, you mentioned a little earlier about creating time for yourself to... Mm -hmm fulfill your passion as an artist right mm -hmm. but you have to flick a switch to do the business side yep. the better you are at business the more time you can be an artist i would i would agree with that i think we're we can align there yeah yeah absolutely. that's why i think mm -hmm. we can align on this piece mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's yeah it's how then do you how do you package that up? So I'm, I'm asking you to wear your director's hat now of PPA board. Okay. How do you as PPA then package that up to come to the members of, of, of PPA to say, yeah, we'll, we'll continue to do this over here, but we know we've been trying to, um, we've put massive resources into help you with the business side as well. And, you know, the better you come at this and when you start charging what you're worth and everything else, it releases more time to do this. But we also want to be able to award you for this and this together because, you know, is there something in that or not? Or am I just... Well, yeah, you know, I think if we actually went and dug into the numbers, the majority of our membership is are utilizing those business tools. No, we don't have an awards for it, but we only have, we have 30,000 members and we only have like 3% actually participating in this, in this fun art competition that we all care so much right. about, you right. know what I mean? So I think the majority of our, the majority of the membership that come to PPA, they don't come to us because they love photography. They come to us for the business resources. They come to us for the insurance. They come to us for the indemnity trust. They come to us for, you know, the, the business resources that they need as a startup. And, you know, the contracts, the, all the stuff to get you going to help with the pricing. I think that we just don't put that package that into what your reward, like you're talking about, you know, but the, the, inter, the photographic competition, it's, it's our sports much more than it is our focus. Does that make sense? Like yes. I'm doing that. It's my annual. I, I tune in all week. I cheer on my friends. I, I think a, I score things in my head if I'm not, you know what I mean? So like for me, it's, it's entertainment and sports and I enjoy it. And I learn a ton from watching it, but PBA is so much more than that competition. That competition is for the diehard people in art. We, as a, as an organization, we offer business resources. Our goal is to make more photographers, successful business owners, um, not better photographers so much as successful photographers. So that would, that would be my answer to that. I just don't know that we've ever, and I don't, I, I could be wrong, but in my discussions, we've never talked about trying to reward that because we have talked about um, how do you, you know, cause there, all the, every once in a while, something gets tossed around about like, well, can we, can we certify people? Can we have, they go through a business program and can we certify people? We're just not in the business of being able to endorse a business you know, through PPA. That's just not what we do. We can help you be successful, set you up for success. It's like giving somebody a driver's license, right? We can get you, you can take the test. We can give you everything you need. We can give you the test. We can't guarantee that you won't drive drunk down the, down the line. You know what I mean? But you are certified to do this thing and are given all the tools that everyone is given available to, you know, to, to be successful at it. So I don't know, you know, I hadn't thought about rewarding and highlighting people for that, but that's a good thing to think about. Mm. Um, 
but yeah, I think come at the competition for more of a, this is sports. And I think that maybe, maybe does that help wrap yourself around it a little bit more? It's what we yeah. all like to shout no, at the no, screen. No, about. no, I get it. <laughs> I get it. I suppose, you know, my passion it's, you know, to, mm -hmm. my passion is to help whatever way I can in a small way to help photographers master the business side because that's what I know and I can do yeah and but I understand the requirement of an artist I have a cousin who's, a, who's, who's an artist and um, he's not a photographer he's an artist so I, I understand the drivers of that and and you know how I've got, tried to get into the head of artists and understand how they think and their passions and what it's about you know and um, but but I'm always just trying to see is um you know, it's it's like you you know when people talk about partnering with a charity, mm -hmm. and you make a donation and you, you get a reduced session fee or whatever that is, and you know some people are cynical and they say, well, is that not being exploiting the charity? You know, and 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 the answer you get is always no, it's not. Of course, it's not because the I can only help more charities by being successful in business in yes. the same as I can only really, if, if I'm a breadwinner in my family and I'm relied on, I can only, I have to fulfill that function while being an artist, you know, and mm -hmm. the better I am at that, then the more time I can even devote to my art. Um, and and I, I just, I'm just looking in at the outside as somebody who doesn't understand fully the mind yeah. of a writer and just say, so do, do I see the leadership in the organizations sort of, trying to marry those things and i'm sure that you all are right because i'm not at that level but I, I just wonder like is it even possible to do and is it something that's on the agenda and are we at the right levels in the industry aware of that you know um well you know we have we have this whole new thing that we just launched that's that's still being upgraded as we go um and it's um it's in ppa edu so all of our PPA members, they can log into their account and go to their, um, their videos, their PPA EDU section, and they can actually, we've set goals for them to reach. So they can actually, there's like badges to unlock, you know, as a means to mark your accomplishment as you go, to see things that you've already watched, see, th you know, mark that off and to help people go down these different routes so that they can, because personally, I'm a level upper. I like to get merit badges. I like to unlock achievements. I like to do all those things. So we have set into place that that launched this year and it's, I'm really excited about it. So you can actually go and track yourself kind of like a Fitbit, you that's, know, like that's a where, great move. I love it. I wasn't aware mm -hmm. of that. That's clever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like yep. So that's coming and that's still evolving as we go. And I'm really excited about the, the Angela is the, the one that is heading that up. Angela at um, PPA. She's amazing. So mm -hmm. and that was her baby. So we're really thankful for her and, and her foresight. To think of stuff like that brilliant no i think i wasn't aware of that and and mm -hmm. yes angela is amazing and we, we all love angela and love spending time with angela hi angela in case you're watching hi angela um, <laughs> the um yes so, so so let's just i can't believe how quick the time's gone and we could stay on this oh oh, I can, hours and hours and hours and hours but we better move on and 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 and, and just talk a little bit about because when i talk to you i can see and i didn't realize that you had you know, become a HTML programmer at a young age that your dad taught oh, yeah. you that, that. So that all starts to make perfect sense to me now. <laughs> um, so, but just have you in, in, in the time we've left, let's just deal with three things as to how you think a lot of photographers can bring technology into their business, either to help with um, streamlining things to be more productive and more profitable as a result. Um, or technology that you can use to help with the whole communication with clients, sales and marketing. Have you any, uh, what thoughts have you around those two requirements? Uh, automation. Anywhere that you can create automation that doesn't come off as robotic, there's a, there's a balance, right? But anywhere where you can create automation is going to serve you well. So for an example, I do a lot of headshots, a lot of headshots throughout the week, throughout the year. There's not like a season that's higher. It's just steady for me. So it got to a point where I was setting up at my business all the time for a headshot. Somebody would, would email me. I would send them information. We would settle on a time and a day that would work. 
And then I would set up for a headshot. And then an hour later, I would have a family shoot come in and it just, the time, it just, the time for setup breakdown, administration emails, trying to set the state, it got to be so cumbersome and take up so much more time. So when I started automating my booking for headshots online, that was a game changer. I set up days on my calendar that are headshot days. Okay. And so when somebody inquires on my website, now I have an automatic, they'll check that they're interested in headshots. Automatically, they receive an email that has information on headshots, uh, examples and booking. So they can go and book a specific time. People love to be able to book something like that, something small, like a headshot session on their own without like 12 back and forths about doing it. They pay online for the session and the images all up front. And then they come in and they do their appointment and they're in and out. And it's so much faster. And I'm not, and so I set up for headshots in the beginning of the day and then I'm doing headshots all day. And it's so, just streamlined things for me. And it's so clever, you know, because, you know, it's, it's, you're right. You can't make a profit unless you systemize it and, and automation is a way to do that. But that's really clever because now rather than switching from, as you said, from a family shoot to a headshot, back to a headshot, back to whatever, mm -hmm. um, you can't make money at that. It's just, it's just, uneconomical and you're not getting paid the figures to do that so i love the way you have you know set days mm -hmm. and, and people book the time which means you've one set up right i'm speaking mm -hmm. i'm asking the question now because i know yeah. so so i have i have uh i've made a system where i have basically one set up that i light a couple of different ways and i have the lights already set up so we get several different looks for people like a light a medium and a dark um headshot background and that pretty much serves most of my clients purposes. And if on my automated form, if they have special requests or if there's something that they need me to match, all that information, I gather, I gather that data on the form so that if I need to have a back and forth with them regarding some specific need, we can do that, you know, but it saves all that time that I was having to book them, get them to pay, you know, find, talk with them about wardrobe, talk with them about the, all this stuff I'm finding that that kind of commodity based thing, like, hi, I am a lawyer and they just told me I'm speaking at a conference and I need a headshot really quick. They don't want to have all this back and forth with me. They really just want to book it and then come in and have it done, you know, and they don't really need anything special, you know? So for me, just being able to know that we don't have to do something super creative and amazing and artsy every single time, this is just something that people need and they are happy with, <laughs> you know? giving yourself the room to, to do that. It just, oh my gosh, so much more profitable, um, so much more time to be able to work on other stuff, you know? So automation is definitely, man. And we talked about client experience there and, you know, a lot of people, you're right, like business people and professional people, like they don't really have time to go through, uh, you know, four conversations with you in a pre-shoot consultation when it's a headshot, you know, it's different if it's- Yeah, they, they don't need to hear your, your whole elevator speech about your art and what you do and how people commission you and whatever that is for your other product. If you have that, you know, yes. that, that is, I spend that time with families when I'm doing that work, but for headshots, it's like, I need a headshot. Can you get me in this week? Because they need it by Friday. Yeah. Great. Here it is. Book it, <laughs> you know, and we get so, it done. So Kira, if I'm not a, if I'm not Kira, i.e. I, I don't have the background in technology and how to put all that together how, how do I go about that? Like, is, is the, I don't know the answer to this and that's why I'm asking, yeah. do you, do you yeah, offer yeah. this as a consultancy service or, um, or do, how, do you offer, I, 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 we've never discussed this. I can, yeah, we haven't discussed this. Yeah. Yeah. So I do a lot of consulting as well. So if you are a photographer and you're just like, I don't know where to start and I just need you to help me point me in the right direction. I'm happy to set up a consult call with, uh, I do it on zoom. So I can do that. Um, but also there are a lot of resources available online where you can set up automated online booking that, um, that work for all kinds of different industries. Um, so I would encourage you to look at that. Very good. And, and, and my understanding of your process is I go to your website. If I'm on headshots, I can mm -hmm. go ahead. I had a quick look today, in fact, and it's, it's very well story branded and the process is there and it's clear and, I, pressed I, was always, I was nervous when you look at my website. I was like, oh, do I pass Merton's website <laughs> test? <laughs> um, um, so I only looked at the headshot page, right? So yeah. it, mm -hmm. it looked really, really good to me. But I would be surprised like with, with, a, with a good friend like Mary Fitz-Taylor, like I'm, I'm sure you guys 
help each other out with that sort of stuff. I know you help Mary with some of the tech and I'm sure she advises yeah, she, on some of that. <laughs> she gives me a lot of advice on the, on that. Yeah, my website is very much story branded, um, which Mary introduced me to uh, when we first met. And, um, you know, the website is less about me and more about what um, what solution do I offer the, the client to, to the client's problem. And so once I kind of wrap my head around that, that was very helpful with creating all of my marketing. Any, any, any time I needed to word something, it was very, it was much more clear on how to do that, <laughs> you know, instead of trying to sell people on, well, you should hire me because I am a master photographer, craftsman, you know, PPA board member, and I'm very important and special. <laughs> Nobody cares, right? Nobody cares. <laughs> What's in it for me? <laughs> What's in it for me is all they want to know when they visit your website, guys. They don't care. Mm -hmm. You've got the latest camera. They don't care what awards you have. They don't care. Oh, it's terrible to say. All they want to know. I know is it's awful because you want people to care. But at the end of the day, you do want to be hired for you. I, I believe in that firmly. I mean, I, but, um, but you, you, if you go on and on and on about how great you are, you're not selling them on the, on the thing that they actually need, which is the photography. So yes, very much following the story brand. And, and, and the other thing that I love about you setting up your set days is it sort of instills a scarcity too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that there's only these slots available on these days. And mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you can with that technology if you want to use that even further. You know, you can you can block out days and then people think that you're already full on those days. You know, even oh, yeah, you can you can block out days. You can have time the way that mine is set up. If I wanted to, I could block off section of the day that I said that I'm available that says I'm not available. So, I mean, you could really you could really do some scarcity um, booking if you if you wanted to. Um, but uh, but but yeah, it's it's really up to you how you want to do it. So. What else have you automated? I'm intrigued. Oh man. Okay. What, well, about, well, what, what, what about um workflow on images? Do you outsource certain oh, retouching? Gosh. Yeah, and I'm a retoucher. Like I, I I actually find retouching to be very therapeutic. I like I like it. Um, but I'm not fast at it. So, you know, because I because I, I get in there in the weeds, you know, like I'm a little obsessive. And so Mary is actually one of the people that was just like, okay, it's, I don't care if you like, it, it's fun. You're, you're bottlenecking. So that was what was happening is the volume with which I was shooting did not match the speed with which I could retouch, you know, uh, to the level that I felt needed it. So I started outsourcing about a year ago. A little, I did a little bit of it, dabbled in it before, but about a year ago, I started really just committing to sending everything out. And when you charge appropriately, the price of sending things out is really nothing you know, because the turnaround time, gosh, especially with headshots. Like I used to feel silly that I would send headshots out when it would be two headshots, you know, for a client, but I would be doing 10 people and two and sometimes five and sometimes seven headshots per client. And it, the bottleneck would happen. And yes, I could do it myself. Absolutely. I could do it myself, but I can't do it as fast as the company I use, which is retouch up. Can't do it as fast as they do it, you know, and turn it around. And it's fine. I, I used to think that I had to have my hand on every, that was the other ego thing, right? Like you'd have to have your hand on every image or else the image is not yours. And on a head, I'm just here to tell you guys, give yourself permission. You don't have to touch it at every moment <laughs> for it to be your work, you know? Um, so I, I started sending that stuff out and it is, it's, whew, I mean, I don't even notice the money going out because I, all I notice is the money coming in because I can take on much more. So I can take on way more shoots and turn them around much more quickly. Um, and it's just right now, right before we got on the call, I had a client, I had a, I had a client, a $10,000 sale client, um, that, uh, I sent her, her digitals cause she purchased her digitals along with a bunch of other wall art. And I asked her if this was approved so that we could go ahead and build her album and, and order her wall art. And she had like six little nitpicky things that she wanted done. Like the lining of the skirt, she felt like the lining of the skirt was showing and she wanted that photoshopped off. And I just took that image and I sent it out right before we got on this call. I was like, great, let me send that out. Please remove the lining on the skirt. And now probably by the time we're done with this call, like I'll have it back and then I can deliver it and order her products. So, I mean, it's worth it to me to be able to automate that, to, to outsource. Um, gosh, the, we, right before you said that, there was one other thing that I was, that I was like, oh, and I also do this. Um, Hmm. Oh, I, I've been using 17 hats to gather, um, to separate 
the the data that clients are entering into my forms. So when somebody enters into a form, I have an ability to separate out somebody who is interested in family portraits, somebody who is interested in headshots, somebody who is interested in corporate headshots for like a large company. You know, so I'm able to separate those things so that I can have mailing lists designed specifically for content for them because my family session clients are there's you know sometimes they need headshots but definitely my headshot clients aren't always interested in portraits of babies so i i don't want to send my business clients a lot of information about family portraits because when they come in here is usually to get their they go oh you do family portraits oh i'll call you for that that is that is the connect point for that but i don't really market to them um you know online the same way that i market to my family clients so it's nice to be able to separate that when um, with a content management system like 17 hats, because then you can, I know you do all this sort of like funneling, right? You're way better at this part than me, but being able to at least have those lists separated so that you know who you can, you're talking to and who the audience is, because knowing who the audience is is so important for your message to get across. Don't you agree? Absolutely. Because <laughs> if you don't have that segmentation, as you say, you know, that's when you get I'm careful, you know, we actually celebrate unsubscribes, but we only mm -hmm. celebrate them because we have our list segmented. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, because they're not interested. But the, the other side of that is if you haven't segmented like you do and you get um, unsubscribes, it may not be that they're not interested. They're just not interested in what you're talking about right now. Like you've just We're said, right. you know, the family aren't mm -hmm. interested in the headshots or whatever. Mm -hmm. So... So I want to jump ahead then. There are three brilliant tips for everybody who's here, who's here tonight. But as somebody who knows technology so well and you know, isn't a technophobe, how do you feel about virtual imaging? I'm excited about virtual imaging. I, I am, I, you know, I am really, well, one, because I, and I can't say too much because I have some, I have some behind the scenes knowledge on what's been planned, okay. but I am, really excited about virtual imaging. Um, one, because I don't know, it kind of feels like the foundation when I got started in the business, um, I didn't know, I, I didn't go to conferences to learn stuff. I learned online. So I'm part of that. I'm, I'm this millennial, oldest millennial, elder millennial generation. So I shot film and all that stuff, but I also learned a lot of my craft online, you know? So, you know, in the beginning, I just sat there and watched and just watch videos, watch tutorials, watch how to's, watch, you know, pause things, save things, went back, took notes, you know? So I, there's something I've gotten very, very comfortable this year in my sweats watching um, videos. So I am excited about that. I'm also excited that it's not just like, I'll give you this insight. It's not just the webinar style, no offense to our webinar that we're having today, you know, but it's, it, there's production that's involved in it that is, um, that is next level. And it's a lot more entertaining to watch. Um, so I'm very, I'm one of the speakers this year and Mary is one of the speakers this year too. And so we have been working with Angela on, um, on trying to um, up our game as far as the production and the content that we're gonna be offering. So I feel like it's gonna be a lot more easy to watch because it's more, it's got a lot more cinematic quality to it. Does that make sense? <laughs> Instead of people just sitting behind, I think you're still gonna feel like you're watching speakers on the stage. I, I'm intrigued and I look forward to it too. Um, I, I think I'm doing a pre-con, so I'm not, uh, um, so I think we're just using Zoom for that, but all the other speakers are, are on the, the main stages. That's going to be the, what you've just described, right? Yes, 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 yes. And so, and the pre-cons, you, you know, don't say just on a Zoom. Like I think pre-cons, cause I've taught pre-cons before too. And it's like, you need to be able to sit at a desk and listen to the instructor and, and work at pre-cons yes. you know what i mean yeah. so to me that format translates very well i mean you know zoom format translates very well for pre-cons because that's um that's more of a classroom in yes. my mind yes you know it what is. I mean? yes it is yes it is, mm -hmm. yes, it is. Mm -hmm. brilliant kira i can't wait listen thank you so much for joining us in the think tank we really appreciate your time we know you're very very busy with everything um, thank you so much for everything you do for the industry and PPA and, 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 and all the judging you do. And I know you work, work really, really hard. Um, you know, so, <laughs> so right. on behalf of everybody, I just want to say thank you, you know, and um, give our, um, Susan sends her love. So our love to Kevin and Lucy too. And, Will do. Uh, 
and we can't wait till we all get together again. And, oh, uh, I can't wait for another shenanigans night. I need uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Shenanigans. <laughs> That's what we want. Another shenanigans. <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today on, on the Think Tank. We'll see you all next Tuesday. And um, if you want to contact Kira, so if you want some help and consultancy in various areas of photography and in all that automation stuff that she's a genius at, kiraderryberry.com, right? Mm-hmm. Yep, you can reach me That's there. That's how they get you. Okay. So, uh, kiraderryberry.com. I think when you Google that, there's only one Kira Derryberry in the world, in the same way That's as you Google Ronan Ryle. There's only one Ronan Ryle in the world, too. So, there we go. <laughs> so, yeah, take care. I, I, well, I, we, we would want more Kira Derryberries in the world. We don't, don't want any more Ronan Ryles in the world. <laughs> not enough. true. Take care, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy. See you all soon. Thanks again, Kira. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.